then that supercompensation effect is not going to work in that same way. You're, you might actually end up with a lower fitness than you had before because you just went too deep and, and there's no way that, that we can get a compensation that is strong enough to dig you out of that deep, deep, deep hole. That triathlon show, 174. Hey, what's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host, Michael, and on today's episode, I do a solo episode, which uh, has been a while since I've done one of those on Mondays, but uh, today I'm doing one, and I'm going to talk about training camps and uh, some tips for how to approach them, what to do, and what not to do to have a successful training camp. <laughs> I probably should have made this episode a bit earlier in the year, because a lot of uh, the listeners may already have been away on a training camp in February or March, but I guess better late than never. There's always a next year that uh, you might be going back on a training camp. So, And I'm sure that many of you are still about to go away on training camps, either independently or on an organized camp. So so there will be plenty of uh, of useful information here for, for, a large, uh, for a lot of the listeners at least. So before we go into the main topic, let's thank our sponsors. First, we have Precision Hydration that uh, I will actually talk about a little bit in the hydration part or electrolytes, I, I guess, more generally speaking. But Precision Hydration is uh, a brand that uh, create electrolyte products that you can you can choose a strength or a concentration of electrolytes that works with your individual electrolyte needs because we all lose different amounts of sodium in our sweat and our sweat rates also vary drastically. So the electrolyte needs of each person is different and precision hydration makes it easy for you to find out how much electrolytes you should consume in training and ra- racing, including training on those hot, uh, warm weather training camps uh, just by simply taking a free online sweat test, which is uh, a quiz that contains 10 questions that you can fill out in just a few minutes. And that will give you then uh, a very, a, a very good benchmark, I guess, or, or a ballpark estimate of how much electrolytes you should consume during your training. So go and check that out on precisionhydration.com and you can get your first box of precision hydration for free with the promo code that triathlon show, all one word, all caps. And big thanks to Roka, that is the world's leading brand for wetsuits, triathlon apparel, and performance eyewear. You can find them on roka.com and get 20% off your entire order with the promo code TTS. Note that this is a new code, so the old one that I've been mentioning for a long time before is no longer working. We have a new code that is TTS, and uh, one of my favorite Roka products actually is their sim shorts so that's uh, roca's buoyancy shorts i use their sim pro 2 version of them and i really love them because they when i train a lot especially and sometimes you do get when you have when you're in a period of heavy training very much sinking legs even though you don't normally have that in swimming so at least more sinking than uh, than what is normal for you and uh, and swimming can be quite almost counterproductive i guess because you're not swimming with your usual form and uh, definitely not with the form that you would have in a wetsuit so the roca sim buoyancy shorts they help you keep a better position in the water and they should not be used as a crutch they should not be used every workout in my opinion but i really like that i can use them and that's how i recommend using them in a strategic manner so that you can get the most out of both your swim sessions when you might otherwise have not as productive a swim session because you're tired from previous bike and run workouts or the other way around if you know that you have a key bike or run in the afternoon and you also are going to try to hit a hard swim in the morning then i like to use the the sim shorts in that hard swim because i'm going to save my save my legs slightly and, and focus more on on the arms and that way i can still feel reasonably uh, fresh for the bike or the run that i'm going to do later in the afternoon so that's one of my favorite roca products but of course they have uh, various lines of product lines in various categories so go and check all of them out on roca.com and use that promo code tts for 20 percent off 
All right, so without any further ado, let's get into the eight tips that I have for training camps. The, t- the first tip is to know thy objective for the training camp. And uh, uh, there are a few, it, this is a pretty simple one, but often overlooked actually. So why do we go on training camps? Well, one is definitely to go and have fun and experience great weather, warmer weather, a lot of sun. If we come from uh, winter climates, that is definitely an important one. But uh, from a training per- performance standpoint, and like, I guess, uh, trying to reach your training and racing goals for the year in in that sense what we're looking for is an overload in training but also a recovery overload both physically and mentally we want to sleep more than usual uh, perhaps take some naps as well and and just mentally get to relax so similar to a vacation will allow you to relax because you don't have work to worry about the training camp also gives you that so although the recovery The net recovery is perhaps not uh, a recovery overload in a training camp, or it is not because you have so much physical stress from the training. But you do want to make sure that that you do get, in absolute terms, more recovery than normal. And that will help you then absorb that training overload. So more sleep than usual, uh, really getting getting food prepared for you, not having to stress about cooking yourself, that sort of thing, and and that mental aspect of it with not having to worry about work, etc. Uh, another part of the objective of a training camp is that you want to be within reach of recovery and super compensation when you finish the camp. So if you dig yourself so deep into a hole that... Uh, even recovering from that camp and getting that super compensation effect, which refers to you having put your body under a big load, but then it will start to try to adapt to that load and build itself back up, so to say, to become uh, stronger and fitter uh, as a consequence of that. That's the super compensation effect. And we want to be within reach of that. The problem is that if you go too deep, then that super compensation effect is not going to work in that same way. Your you might actually end up with a lower fitness than you had before because you just went too deep and and there's no way that that we can get a compensation that is strong enough to dig you out of that deep 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 hole so keep that in mind that at the end of the camp you need to be within reach of recovering and super compensation and also you want to finish the camp in a position to resume consistent training right away when you get home now I'll get to how to continue training after the camp in in a later point but uh, you want to be in a position where you could go out for an easy training session uh, when you get back home immediately after the training camp so so that's uh, those are some of the main objectives here that we want to achieve and keep uh, keep I guess at the front of of our minds and uh, and always have as the the north stars and we will base the decision making within the camp on whether or not we're on track to, to achieving those objectives for the camp. All right. So tip number two is do not kill yourself. And this uh, is, uh, I guess, uh, a corollary to, to number one, to knowing your objective and being within reach of recovery and super compensation. If you really kill yourself, uh, figuratively speaking, of course, then uh, that's not going to be of any benefit for you because you're not going to be able to get that super compensation. How do we then achieve this? Because it is quite common for, for people, for age groupers to go away on training camps and, and absolutely smash it and, and in a figurative sense, killing themselves and not really getting what they should be getting out of that training camp, not, not getting the performance benefits from a season perspective. The first thing is that I want you to really think about coming in fresh for the training camp. So at least the few days before the training camp should be uh, very easy training days. It might even be that the entire week before the training camp is uh, is an easy week so that you start out well recovered on the first day. If you're already in a slightly pre-fatigued state when you're starting the training camp, then it will be even more likely that with the increased volume that you're likely going to be doing for most age groupers, that is the case, a large increase in training volume when you go out on training camp. 
if you're in a pre-fatigue state, then that's going to make it even more difficult to achieve those main objectives that we talked about before. So start out from a blank slate, from a well-recovered slate, and that is going to make you more likely to achieve a successful training camp. The other and very important aspect here is to avoid or limit intensity greatly limit intensity do not race anybody or anything not even yourself on the training camp especially for for the age groupers the typical age grouper that might be training 10 11 hours or less per week so it might be even just six or seven hours per week and then you go out and do a training camp and and that training camp may usually that's the way they are organized in in most cases even for the more beginner level athletes it's uh, or mid pack like low volume age groupers they will typically do 15 hours or more of training in that training camp week and 15 hours would probably be on the lower side that that's just the way that it is in this climate I, i'm not saying that that's the, the amount that you should shoot for i'm not saying that it's right or wrong but i'm saying that that's probably what what is going to happen at least if you're going to an organized training camp and it's not an, an independent training camp that you organize for yourself well if you are increasing the training volume by by at least 50 percent or probably close to 100 percent then uh you definitely do not want to do that sort of volume increase and also doing intensity so limit and uh, i would say avoid as much as possible intensity because it's not going to be of any additional benefit for you you're you're only going to dig yourself deeper but you, your problem will not be that you don't get a big enough stimulus from the training camp that that you don't uh, that you don't have a big enough dose of training, a big enough overload to to adapt to. Your problem will be, if any, that you have too big a load and you can't adapt to that for that reason. So we know that the volume is going to be big. That means let's focus on avoiding or limiting intensity, not racing yourself and not racing anybody else, letting people go if they want to go and race those hills on the bike ride. That's totally fine. You keep your main objective in mind and uh, and also what you're going to do in race season and how this is going to affect your race season later on in terms of how much uh, your training load can and should increase i would say that uh, do not do anything more than than double the the duration that you're you're used to from at least a a few weeks uh, moving average prior to the training camp so so if you're used to training eight eight hours per week eight to nine hours per week then i think that you shouldn't be doing more than 16 to 18 hours on that training camp and and that's on the high end so that doesn't mean that it's it's totally fine to go out and and do 13 14 hours that's that's already going to be such a great stimulus for you it's a big increase compared to what you're used to so again keep that main the big picture in mind and the main objectives you're trying to get a training load an overload that you can adapt to and again it's still going to be a big overload the problem is not going to be that it's not big enough but rather that it's too big potentially so when i say no more than double i really mean no more than double i don't mean double it and maybe a bit more that's that's definitely not what i'm saying so so do not get me wrong there Uh, and uh, in terms of some people like to use tss and and that can be fine Uh, so same thing there do not do anything more than double the amount of tss although remember that not all tss is created equal so i actually much prefer that you focus on on the simpler metrics here so focusing on the duration of training that you you do also make sure here that you keep that discipline specific training load in check as well so so let's say that you do train eight hours per week so fine you decide that you're not going to train any more than 16 hours per week on that training camp but if as part of those eight hours of training per week you have only been cycling for two hours per week the last month or two then suddenly going to 10 hours of cycling in one week uh, that's uh, not really something that you should do even even if your overall training volume would stay within that uh, twice the amount of, of volume range so this is an area where you need to adjust your training on the training camp accordingly but also you need to check your training many many weeks in advance like making sure that you actually train for the training camp 
So you you know that most likely you are going to do a lot of cycling on that training camp. That's the way most training camps are structured for pretty good reason. So nothing wrong with that at all. That means that in training, you you want to be building up to a specific threshold at least of of uh, training cycling volume so that you can then go out and do that higher volume on the training camp and not doing too big a jump in that discipline and the same of course goes for the other disciplines especially but but running is is especially important for just the injury risk and uh, and the amount of recovery that it takes so so that's also something to consider uh, quite quite uh, carefully and uh, finally underneath this uh, segment this tips on do not kill yourself you should feel totally fine and confident skipping sessions completely and opting for recovery instead of them again keeping those overall objectives in mind and i would say that this is especially important in the early days of the camp when you don't yet quite know how you will react to the greatly increased training volume and and training load Uh, so if you skip uh, a workout or two in those early days and then you find that you feel totally fine with the training load that you're managing then maybe you do those optional workouts or additional workouts whatever you want to call them later on in the week uh, because you you have already tested the waters and you feel good you you feel that you are recovering appropriately and your volume is within those sort of uh, benchmarks that we established then fine go out and do them later on in the week but in the early parts of the week especially uh, err on the side of being conservative rather than doing too much all right so number three on our list here is uh, the recovery after training camps i think that you you must have at least one complete rest day after a training camp and uh, two is uh, more than fine if you feel you need it this is quite individual for many athletes i think that active recovery like just a very short run or very short easy ride or or a swim might be a better option because uh, it feels good to get moving a little bit but nothing long nothing intense at all Uh, so day number two is sort of i guess depending on how you feel optional and and how you think that you usually recover better whether it's active recovery or complete rest but regardless day number two should also be super super easy and short if by the way one of those rest days or the day after the training camp is a long and stressful travel day which it may be for uh, for a lot of us and this is like what is a long and stressful travel day it is quite subjective in my opinion it's i guess based on how you perceive it in your uh personally like do you perceive it as being long and stressful or do you perceive it as being fairly easy Uh, maybe i perceive going to the canary islands from lisbon which is a short flight uh, i can still perceive that as being long and stressful or coming back from a camp on the canary islands whereas somebody uh, coming from uh, uh, from finland or sweden it's a much longer trip of course but they might just uh feel that it's it's not that hard after all so uh, so it, it really is subjective but if you do perceive it as being long and stressful then i would definitely say that take that second rest day as a complete rest day as well uh, because that travel day i would then not really count as a complete rest day even though you're not training but it, but it's not complete rest so uh, the week then uh, after the training camp if we look at the big picture it should be an easy week a very easy week with uh, low volume and uh, no intensity Uh, so this is quite important don't do intensity the week after the training camp but do keep up the training frequency the volume can stay low because you do short sessions but uh, i think that after those one or two rest days that you do you should train as frequently as you're used to doing in your normal routine but uh, the sessions can be shorter than usual and easier than usual as i said so this week will give you it will keep you consistent but it will also allow your body time uh, and space to to recover because the the overall load is is so low and uh, but this is not the case if you if you went and overdid it on the camp then even even that will be impossible keeping up the the training frequency even at a low volume and no intensity level so so that's where you know that you overdid it if you can't if you can't do that and you don't and you feel too mentally fatigued to go and do that sort of tr- easy training and just keeping up the frequency that's when you know that you overdid it 
Uh, so, so keep that in mind as well. Uh, that's, uh, so that's the recovery week after. So, so for one week, you, you do no intensity still after the training camp because you already got such a big overload. So you still need your body to recover from that. So at that point, no point adding on extra intensity. Just keep, keep ticking over. And uh, during that time, your body will uh, go through that super compensation response, hopefully. And then the next week, you can go back to, to normal training. So, so week number, if that week is week number one after training camp, then week number two after training camp, that's when you can resume normal training. All right. So tip number four is uh, consistency around and after, especially after the training camp. So this is goes hand in hand with the, with the previous uh, tip. It, and that is that if you get so fatigued that you end up missing planned training because of the training camp, then you overdid it. And by the way, this is quite an important point, missing planned training. So I would suggest that, uh, well, if you are uh, self-coached, you actually plan your week after training camp before you go for the training camp and not during or after. You should plan it before so that you know what you have coming up. And that will also, I guess, act as a sort of motivation and awareness to not overdo it on the training camp itself. Uh, if, but if you end up missing that planned training, that low intensity, low volume, but frequent training, then you probably overdid it. And the same goes for niggles that suddenly come up and also illnesses potentially are at least in part probably caused by lower immu- immune functionality. And that is normal. Like you have to expect that. Uh, it's, it's not that we can't keep the immune function at 100% when we go on training camp, even if we do it right, because it's still an overload and any overload is going to have an effect on the immune system. But if you overdo the overload, that's when it, uh, it gets even more exponentially more risky and you exponentially increase the risk of getting any illness. So, uh, so those are some, uh, some things to, to avoid and because those will derail your consistency. And if your consistency after the training camp is derailed, then that a trade-off is not worth it. Like the, the overload that you got from the training camp is, is no longer going to really be, be worth it when, when you consider that you then have to take time off training, even if it's not much, but you do want to keep that consistency up at all costs. That is more important than having an epic training camp. Uh, so, so we could say that an epic training camp is more like an epic failure if you can't go through that easy week after and then after that easy week get back into your more or less normal training again in that week number two after training camp then i would say that chances are that you would have been better off taking it much easier on the training camp or at least a bit easier on the training camp and then being able to more quickly get back into your normal training routine All right, so that was number four. And, uh, and number five is uh, uh, around training, some specific tips around training. So first, uh, a, gen- a couple of general tips. So your mindset, and this, again, we have alluded to already. Know your objectives for the training camp and keep those objectives top of mind. And this, uh, the main reason for this is that it will help you not to get dragged into stupid workout races with others or with yourself. Uh, it, will, it will help you focus and not... Uh, push the intensity which we do want to avoid or limit the second general tip is to take the opportunity to work on technique and uh, because if you are at an organized training camp you will have coaches around you so as much as possible ask for the coaches feedback on your technique in swimming biking and running and uh, and try to take this opportunity because it's not every day that you're going to have coaches around you that can look at you actually execute your uh, your swimming biking and running movement patterns and and help you correct any potential issues or tell you what you're doing well and what could be improved so so technique focus on technique and ask for your coaches feedback and especially so of course in the swim because it's such a technical technical sport so getting into the swim then so as a corollary to that one If uh, the camp offers video analysis or individual technique lessons, one-on-one private lessons, then absolutely go for it. It is so worth the investment to do that. So so that's a no-brainer if that is offered as part of the camp or, or as an add-on to the camp. Usually it's it wouldn't be included in the in the price, but you could you could buy it uh, at, at an additional cost. Uh, the second swim tip is to do mobility before your sessions. Just five minutes of mobility is enough. 
your coach can help you with uh, with getting a routine going and mobility before a swim session is really great regardless like even back home but i highlight this here in the context of training camps because with the amount of training that you're doing you're most likely going to be a bit stiffer than normal and uh, and perhaps have get a bit little bit of a restricted mobility spending a lot of time on the bike and and also running those sorts of things can reduce your mobility a bit acutely and and that will then cause you to potentially not have the most productive swim sessions so this is like a really high return on investment thing that you can do just do five minutes of mobility before getting into the pool or into the open water in at your swim sessions and finally for the swim uh, this is of course depending on how the camp is organized but i would encourage you to uh, to do as much swimming as possible in the open water as most of us are quite limited in how much open water swimming we do of course the exception to this would be when you do like a video analysis session or individual technique lesson then you should be in the in the pool and uh, because that's way easier to to give feedback and get feedback in in that environment but but i would try to uh, to do quite a bit of open water swimming a lot a majority of your swimming in the open water as opposed to in the pool although some of it can be in the pool and and it also depends of course on your your individual strengths and weaknesses like if open water swimming is a limiter for you it's even more important than for somebody who is quite fine in the open water and and not really not, not really somebody who who has that as a weakness compared to their pool swimming on the bike then uh, one of my main tips here is that if you will encounter a lot of hills which is often the case uh, in very common camp locations that we have here in europe at least like on the canary islands uh, majorca uh, there will be a lot of hills in many cases so make sure that you prepare for this in training before going away on camp and do practice low cadence uh, muscular endurance type uh, cycling in advance also the bike is where it's uh, probably the most likely that everybody will be trying to kill each other by going hard up hills etc and uh, here it's super important that you do not follow the herd go your own pace and uh, and keep those objectives uh, left right and center on the run be very very careful uh, especially if you are injury prone or in general if you feel that you have any niggles that might be coming on then it's better to be safe than sorry and maybe skip a run if needed the higher training volume not just on the run but also the bike and even the swim in general is going to make you more at risk for injury so so do not uh, do, do not take any stupid risks here also it's even more important on the run than the other disciplines i feel to avoid intensity uh, completely again due to that injury risk when you're already fatigued from the camp uh, to add in- intensity on top of that on the run with all the eccentric loading and neuromuscular strain that's uh, that's not something that i recommend so so here is the most important discipline where i want you to really focus on avoiding intensity and finally same as the swim uh, you are going to be uh, stiff and physically fatigued doing mobility before your run sessions doing a bit of foam rolling and then some dynamic warm-ups that's going to really make you run better and even if it's just easy runs that you're going out for that still makes a difference you're, you're going to be running with better form better economy and uh, and that's always valuable so again a great return on time invested all right so we're getting to tip number six if i've uh, counted correctly and that is nutrition and hydration so here uh, first of all the first thing that i noted down here is to limit alcohol or avoid it completely if you can at least until the last night uh, because this will alcohol will first of all it will uh, lower your sleep quality so your recovery quality will also be lower for that reason and uh, yeah that, that is the main thing really uh, the the other aspects like dehydration you can compensate for that by just staying on top of your hydration overall but i, I think that the main reason here really is to uh, to not shortchange your recovery because it's going to be so important with the amount of training that you're doing and the finer the line that you're treading like if you're really trying to do double the volume that you're used to uh, going from 10 to 20 hours or whatever then uh, that's going to make it even more important to to make sure that you you get everything right all the marginal gains and and if that includes 
cutting out al- alcohol completely, then I think that that's something that you you should do if uh, if you want to to make that big of a jump in in the training that you're doing when you're out on camp. Uh, second, related to this, is uh, make hydration a top priority, both in workouts and after workouts, and in between workouts and in, in general. In hot weather camps uh, and where you'll be sweating a lot, you'll be doing long workouts. Uh, do make sure that you get in electrolytes. So <laughs> I like pre- precision hydration, as you know, but uh, you can get in electrolytes from from other sources as well. Uh, what whatever you fancy, but it is important in when you will be sweating a lot, you'll be training for a long time, you will recover better and you will be better rehydrated when you get those electrolytes in, which will help you perform better in those upcoming workouts that will be coming uh, coming very frequently. You'll probably be training two to three times per day most of the days on, on camp. So so make hydration a top priority, both in workouts, after workouts, and, and in between workouts and in general. And similarly, fueling during and after workouts is another top priority. Uh, this is not uh, the training camp is definitely not a situation to try to limit your fueling or anything like that from the get-go of your bike rides for example start fueling immediately do it consistently throughout the ride and l- over the course of the entire camp that is going to make a massive massive difference because otherwise you're going to get into uh, a glycogen depleted state anyway that, that is more than likely at least over the course of a day then if you have a massive buffet dinner then perhaps you you might replenish most of that overnight but uh, but over the course of a day if you do not fuel properly you are going to get glycogen depleted uh well you're going to do get that sorry you're going to get glycogen depleted even if you are refuel fuel fueling properly but but if you don't fuel properly then that's where it gets really really difficult to to bounce back and uh and have any sort of quality because even though i said that we want to avoid intensity that doesn't mean that uh that you can't feel strong in your at at your endurance training zones on those long bike rides and be able to keep up that sort of uh that sort of power on the bike for example for for the four hours or five hours or whatever you're out for so so this is super important both during and after workouts after workouts make sure that you in addition to carbohydrate also get in uh, protein to se- stimulate that uh, muscle protein synthesis process and get that going as quickly as possible and for both fueling and hydration, I recommend that if you can, bring your own gels and electrolytes so that you get a lot of practice using the products that you will be using in your races as well. And finally, for overall nutrition, make sure that you meet your carbohydrate and protein demands and uh, do not like try to get, get it in very frequently, both in workouts, but also between workouts. So snacking is good. Uh, getting in a constant supply of of energy rather than having uh, like having to rely on a massive buffet dinner in the evening like for example on the protein side of things you should have protein throughout the day for breakfast lunch and dinner and post-workout rather than having three massive steaks as part of your dinner and two pieces of cheese cheesecake to uh, to replenish replenish those carbohydrates but also a lot of fat of course in the cheesecake uh, so, so rather than doing that, make sure you're getting a constant supply throughout the day of energy, but also the different macronutrients. Number seven is to get your recovery right. And uh, the, the first and foremost thing here is sleep. Sleep enough. Don't stay up too late. Uh, make try to get much more sleep than you usually get at least for the majority of us we we could sleep a bit more than we do in normal day-to-day life that's just the way it is i know it is for me certainly so if i sleep seven hours per night normally i would definitely try to sleep eight to nine hours when i'm away on, on training camp and and part of that might be to to actually get a nap that that's that's a really good thing to do on training camps especially uh, napping between your your lunch and your late afternoon workout, for example, might be a great thing to do. Uh, just 30 minutes or so, uh, even 15 minutes, that's totally fine. Uh, it could be longer depending on, even though long naps are usually not recommended and I don't recommend them either. But uh, for especially if you are a bit short on sleep from before the camp, for example, or even from the nights during the training camp for whatever reason, then I would rather take a longer nap and uh, then be a bit groggy rather than uh, 
I guess getting getting too little sleep overall. Of course, don't take so long naps that you then have difficulty falling asleep again in the evening. But uh, but as as much as you'll be training, usually that won't be a problem. The second uh, aspect of of recovery we already talked about: nutrition and hydration. Uh, so so that's part part of the previous point: getting nutrition and hydration right. The main part actually is that it will be super important for your recovery. Uh, so carbohydrate and protein. Uh, fluids, uh, but as, and also electrolytes, they, they are some key, key aspects to consider. And a training camp is definitely a situation where those marginal gain recovery modalities have their place. So foam rolling, massages, uh, compression gear, uh, those sorts of things can all be beneficial. They, they're all going to add a percentage point or they might add a percentage point of two of recovery, which can be really important for you and how you feel and perform the next day because you are under such a high training load at in that training camp situation. So, so getting that, especially if you have good access to good sports massage, that's definitely something that I would, uh, I would recommend that you go and do it a couple of times during the training camp. And uh, finally, in terms of recovery, if at all possible, avoid work, email, and other similar work and, uh, I guess, stress-inducing activities. Uh, so, because this is going to be something that, not physically, but mentally, it's going to allow you to recover also if you can, if you can completely cut out that sort of, not distraction, but, I guess, stress. Uh, so, I have a personal example where I did not do this very well, and that was... Uh, two years ago, more or less exactly, maybe 106 weeks ago, I was uh, uh, at a training camp with my then coach in uh, Cyprus. And that was right around, it was, it was the exact week that I launched the first episode of that triathlon show. And also, uh, I was uh, working a little bit because I was working for a startup, a medical device startup at the time. So even though I had uh, quote unquote vacation, uh, I did have some tasks that nobody else than me could do in the startup because I had been the project lead for developing an app that we had just launched to go with our medical device. And uh, my teammates were at a conference running demos of the app uh, and they ran into some technical difficulties. So I had to uh, to coordinate with them and with the developers in uh, in Eastern Europe and make sure that everything was running smoothly so that they wouldn't have a disaster or a conference. So I had a lot of stress with both the podcast launch and then working for uh, for my employer with with that app development project uh, in between workouts. I, I remember coming in from uh, from a ride, for example, that we had done in the morning and maybe coming in at one or two in the afternoon and then then having a couple of hours until a, until a run or a swim in the afternoon and uh, rather than taking a nap and and just relaxing as i recommended you do uh, i <laughs> i spent that t- I spent that time working on either the podcast launch or uh, for for the startup so so that wasn't ideal by by no means so what i want you to do is avoid situations like that So tip number eight is about gear, equipment, and I guess packing and preparation lists for you. Uh, first of all, especially if you're a weaker cyclist, then consider what sort of bike gearing you have. If, you, if you'll be going to a place with a lot of hills, especially, it might be worth uh, changing your gearing so that you can you have an easier time getting up those hills. So, so I think about that, whether it's, uh, it applies to you and if it might, might be worth changing gearing. So you don't have to grind and grind and grind for hours and hours. Uh, second, as mentioned, fueling and hydration. If uh, you can, I recommend bringing your own, uh, be- rather than buying at the location, because then you can actually practice with the type of fueling and hydration, like the same gels, same sports drinks, same electrolytes that you'll be using in races. On the swim, well, I mentioned in uh, Roka's uh, sponsorship slot, the sim shorts, the buoyancy shorts, and I do like to use them in heavy training weeks and uh, to strategically to, to make sure that I have good swims, but also that I recover well from the swims and have a good uh, run or bike after that. So uh, buoyancy shorts can be good to pack because when you are under heavy training load, uh, it's uh, much easy, easier to uh, fall into poor poor swim form and poor swim mechanics due to that fatigue 
and uh, those buoyancy shorts help with that and you'll still get a great workout in uh, and and you will be more focused on the slightly more focused on the upper body you'll still need to use your core it's uh, not taking away that if you want to get the maximum propulsion you still need to to use that r- rotation and drive from the hip so, so you'll still need to use that but i would recommend bringing buoyancy shorts if you have them because that can help you help you recover better from the swims and also p- have an easier time performing in swims when you are under heavy training load and that way you'll get more out of them compression wear as mentioned for that those uh, marginal gains in terms of recovery uh, if you like using compression wear i i really don't i'm not in the habit of using it using it but i know that some people swear by it and and it can potentially have have a benefit for recovery so so do bring that if you if you want to and if you're used to doing it if you're not a user then i wouldn't bother going out and buying compression wear just for the sake of it other recovery modalities as mentioned as well that that you think work for you the foam roller is a really good one especially since you can also use that before your swims and runs to to acutely increase that mobility as talked about lacrosse balls uh trigger point uh tools etc those those are all good things whatever you're used to using bring bring those uh, if, if they might help you and finally earplugs face mask etc so that you can sleep especially during nap time when it might not be completely dark in your hotel room uh, that sort of thing can really be important so so that you can make sure that you get that sleep as mentioned so that wraps it up for this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. A solo episode uh, on a specific topic rather than a and a which uh, has been a while. It has been a while since I did one of those. So, so I quite enjoyed this. It was, it was fun, fun doing this. And the show notes, as usual, you can find on thattriathlonshow.com and click through to this particular episode, 174. And any comments or questions that you have, leave them in at the bottom of the page. There is a comment section where you can comment. Related to this topic, every now and then I get questions about when I'll run my next training camp. And uh, so I want to take this opportunity to to give an update on that. And that is that I do not plan to do any training camps in the 2019. But uh, possibly in the winter or spring of 2020, I would actually really like to do that, although I haven't decided yet. It would most likely be down in the Algarve in uh, the, the southern Portugal. And maybe around this time of year, March or possibly early April, that's a fantastic time to go to the Algarve. Uh, so if you are interested, please do let me know. Send me an email, michael at scientifictriathlon.com. And uh, the, the reason for letting me know is that then I can put you on a waiting list and give you first dibs on spots if I do decide to do those training camps. And also it will allow me to gauge the interest and know whether it's worth to put in the effort and time even just uh, starting to plan a, a training camp in the first place. Uh, so uh, because I, I, I'm not sure and I do a lot of other things, other, other activities as well. So so it's always uh, something you always need to, to balance the activities that you're doing. So, uh, so I won't do this if there isn't enough interest. Uh, so, so do let me know. That would be, would be good if you do that. The next episode on the podcast will be another solo episode and uh, this one will be on popular request. I'll discuss more about my own training philosophy because you hear it in bits and pieces in the Q&A and in the interviews as well. But I haven't really talked a lot about it in a dedicated episode. So, so I'll do an episode on that and I'll actually wait to record that episode until Tuesday the 26th of March uh, so that if you have specific questions within that broad topic of my thoughts on training and training philosophy, then you can send in those questions again to michael at scientifictriathlon.com and I can answer them on the podcast. So so if you listen to this episode as it comes out on Monday the 25th of March, then you have today, Monday and early Tuesday to to send in your, your questions before I record that episode. And uh, I, I have to admit, I've been slacking quite a bit with interviews, so I don't have any interviews in the backlog at the moment. That is uh, in large part due to moving to another apartment, which took me a lot of time. And, and now the racing season is starting, so on the weekends I'm quite busy racing, uh, many weekends at least, not all of them. But uh, I do have some really good ones that uh, I have scheduled, so... 
after next week i'm pretty sure that uh, that i will have a fantastic interviewee on again and that will be dan lodang who is jan Ferdeno's coach he is scheduled to come on for an interview although i haven't conducted it yet so if you do have any questions for him uh, you can also send them in through as well and i will have time to to see them before we do the interview with uh, with dan so uh, so send them in if you have any questions for him Finally, thank you so much again for all the great ratings and reviews. Uh, just know that I appreciate it immensely and your help really does matter. And every single review makes a big difference for many reasons. But one of the main ones is that I get motivated from reading them, especially now, as I mentioned, that I, I don't have a backlog of interviews. It would be easy to maybe skip doing this, uh, this episode because I just don't have time, quote unquote. Uh, and, uh, but. The motivation that I get from these reviews that come in, that's what keeps me going and keeps me consistent. So it's not easy to produce a podcast like this, as I'm sure you understand. It takes many, many hours for each episode that I do. Uh, so, so getting that motivation, it, uh, it makes a massive difference for me in, in keeping going. And I want to read one review as I do sometimes. And this one is from Triathlete 1000. And uh, it's uh, in the UK, I think. I didn't actually note that down. I, I think it was the UK. Uh, anyway, uh, it reads, Great podcast, five stars. I listen to a lot of multi-sport podcasts, and this is easily one of my favorites. Michael is uh, particularly good at getting concrete actions for us age group athletes from guests he interviews. I enjoy the scientific approach uh, that Michael takes with his podcast and uh, that he's good at sniffing out rhetorical, rhetorical meaningless answers and quickly lasers into specifics. Thank you so much for that review. I really appreciate it. And if you have uh, been listening for a long time, I would really appreciate it if you could take a couple of minutes to go and review it on Apple Podcasts or iTunes or wherever you can review your, uh, review any podcasts, any, uh, any location helps, but Apple Podcasts or iTunes are the best. And you can, you can download iTunes, iTunes to your PC and create an account and, and review it there. And that's what, what I do because I, I use an app, Pocket Casts, that doesn't have a reviewing system. So when I listen to podcasts that I really like, I use my iTunes account, even though I don't use iTunes for anything else rather than, uh, than reviewing other podcasts. So, so I go to iTunes and review those other podcasts. So just a tip that that's something that you, you could be doing. Big thanks to our sponsors. First, we have Roka that you can find on roka.com and use the promo code TTS to get 20% off your entire order. Perhaps those buoyancy shorts, the Roka Sim shorts to use on your next training camp. And thanks to Precision Hydration that you can find on precisionhydration.com. Go and take their free online sweat test to get an individual hydration strategy for your training and racing. And use the promo code that draft on show all on word, all caps, to get your first box of electrolytes for free. Thank you, as always, for listening. Keep training smart and keep loving triathlon.